What can I say? It is by wearing a tie that I distinguish myself from the company of architects tonight. <laughs> it's a very sad honor for me to be accepting this prize tonight. But I'll put the emphasis on the word honor because to be associated with Zaha in any way has just been such a tremendous honor to me and to my colleagues. And so I can't help but say the name Zaha with a sense of celebration. And so tonight we celebrate. Now, I'd like to just tell you a story that rather captures the story of our building and of my friendship with Zaha. It goes back nearly two decades. I was introduced to Zaha by her brother, her late brother, Fulath, who came to our Middle East Center in the late 1990s to edit their father's memoirs. He was an established political figure in Iraq under the monarchy and just after the revolution. And Fulath, flamboyant, charismatic, irrepressible, became a real pillar of our community. And it was through Fulath that I was introduced to his amazing sister Zaha, for whom he had unlimited pride. He bragged about her ceaselessly, relentlessly. And at a time when I knew nothing about architecture, it was somewhat lost on me. But it wasn't to stay that way. Ever proud of his sister, Fulath drew her into his new community at the Middle East Center in St. Anthony's College in Oxford University. And through him, I was drawn into her amazing world, a world of openings and of exhibitions. I remember going to the Design Museum for that fabulous show that they put together of her work for the opening of Maxi after a decade's wait. So there was a sense of great excitement in keeping the company of Fulath and his kid sister. But I have a sense that I was invited to a lot of these things because you see, Zaha adored her brother Fulath. And I'd get invited because if I went, she was convinced that Zaha Fulath would go as well. And so in a way, I became something of a kid brother even before I became a client. In 2003, I took full advantage of our connections to invite Zaha to come and give our big annual lecture at the Middle East Center. And I look back on that with so much embarrassment because it is a rather parochial affair. And here we had the greatest star of architecture come to Oxford. And it was in the response of a vast group of strangers who flooded our lecture theater, people I'd never seen at a Middle East Center event before, but was soon to learn was every architecture student within 400 miles of Oxford who, hearing that we had Zaha, descended upon us. And in 2006, our relationship took a dramatic turn when we had the opportunity to commission Zaha to actually do a new building for us. This was a result of a conversation with a very generous benefactor named Namir Kardar, himself an Iraqi like Zaha, and bound to her by long-standing family ties. This came on the eve of the 50th anniversary of our center, at a time when we were talking about expanding our facilities with a new building. With his support, we had the funds to go forward and develop a concept and see where it would take us. But I have to tell you, nobody held out much hope for a Zaha in Oxford. I have it on good authority that the practice only took the commission, believing that there wasn't a chance in hell we'd ever get planning permission. The design taken to stage C in the course of 2006 was unveiled at our 50th anniversary celebrations in 2007. And rather like the lecture that Zaha gave in 2003, when these designs were unveiled, it was to the bemusement of our community. They simply didn't know what to make of a Zaha building, to try and get their heads around the curves, the shapes, the space, and how it might all hold together. But nonetheless, we took those plans forward in 2008 to a skeptical North Oxford Planning Committee who were still asking that key question, how would a Zaha fit in conservative North Oxford, a conservation area known as a leafy Victorian suburb with very strict rules on what one might build there, as you would expect. Now the shape, the great double curves of its western facade was already wild enough, but there were huge questions hanging over the project about what it would be made from, what was the material of the cladding, and what color would it be? So um, it was precisely the kind of questions over which Zaha would not be rushed. The questions of the look of the building were things she took very seriously. And as we were coming close to that fateful day to go for planning permission, I was getting more and more concerned that this was going to become an issue that was really going to 
mess up our chances. So I decided to make an appointment to go and visit Zaha in her office and just force the issue with her. Went down to the offices in Bowling Green Lane. She agreed to see me, but in the course of that day, I must have met with every architect in the practice except Zaha, who very artfully dodged me the whole day. I uh, found great sympathy from Patrick and from Jim and from Johannes and everybody else there, but basically, um, they, none of them was in a position to decide on behalf of Zaha without Zaha's express approval. So I went home empty-handed at the end of the day and decided that I was going to have it out with Zaha in my most reliable means of communication, which was, of course, the SMS text. I don't, I don't know how many of you were friends with Zaha, but if you were, you'll know that the text was something she wielded with great precision and speed. I've kept them all on my, on my cell phone. I can't delete them. They're, they're a record. I've been typing them up as a sort of record of her involvement in this project, and they go to like 50 or 60 pages. But I thought I'd share one with you. They kind of captured what it was like working with Zaha when it came to the clutch. So Eugene, after his frustrating day at Bowling uh, Green Lane. Hi, Zaha. Sorry to miss you. <laughs> Met with Ken and Patrick. Uh, this is Ken Bostock and Patrick Schumacher. We need a decision on color before we submit to planners. Both Ken and Patrick agree we can achieve good result in very dark bronze, and planners make clear that they think a dark finish most likely to secure permission. As client, we are very happy with dark bronze. Can you approve best Eugene? Zaha, no bronze. Need samples urgent. Okay, but I'm in communication now, so Eugene. Samples take too long. There will be time to get the materials right after we get permission. We must agree material and color before it goes to the council. And shiny dark bronze, most likely to get permission. <laughs> Best Eugene. Zaha. Don't want it, sorry. This is in real time, so Eugene. Okay, but the planners won't go for white. Until this point, all of our models were done in sort of white plastic. What are our options? E, Zaha, white. <laughs> now, now, at that point, I knew that the text was failing me as a mode of communication. <laughs> so I suggested we continue talking to each other on the telephone like normal human beings. Zaha said, okay, I'll call you later. And I said, anytime, thank you. Now, here's the clincher in this story, because everyone will tell stories about how Zaha could be frustrating or infuriating or whatnot, but she really wasn't. This was an issue that made, meant a great deal to her. It really mattered to her what the look and the feel of the building would be, and she didn't wish to be rushed, nor did she wish to be unreasonable. So about 20 minutes later, I get another text out of the blue from Zaha. She goes, okay, brown, unless it's material, no good. And then she goes on to give you the kind of explanation about what's going on in her thinking, which just made working with her such a joy. She goes on and says, black looks like a black whale, and too many references to black buildings. So she says she would approve glass in dark color or metal in any color, but not going for dark, fake material. It really mattered. The materiality, the look, the detail was absolutely everything to her. And for that, I think, you know, we've only got Zaha's sense of perfection to thank for the final result we got. In the end, we did go to planning without having decided what the color or the material of the building would be. We did secure planning permission, but it was a cliffhanger. We had an entirely split planning committee, and it was down to the casting vote of the chairman. By the skin of those nails, we got through with planning permission. And in due course, samples of different cladding materials were